He said that um, it was about a, a church that had stars on the wall on the way in. So as you walked in the foyer, there were all these stars. It was in America, there were all these stars on the wall. And uh, each of the stars were there for uh, members of that congregation that had served in the armed forces and had, had given their lives in service of their country. And so each of those people, there was a star on the wall. And one day the mother was walking in with the uh, small boy. <laughs> and the boy looks up and he says, Mummy, what are all those stars? And uh, the mother says this, she says, uh, there's one there for each person who died in the service. And the boy looks back at mum and goes, was that the morning service or the evening service? What <laughs> service are you talking about? But um, the reason that lines up with my message is because we're going to have a look at uh, a message that was preached by the first New Testament Christian martyr, a uh, man by the name of Stephen, who uh, you would probably know Stephen from earlier in the book of Acts. There was a uh, dissension in uh, the distribution of food to the Greek-speaking widows. So there was a, a food uh, network there. They were looking after widows, and there was a, uh, a few, few things going on there that were recognised by the, for lack of a better word, by the actual congregation uh, crowd themselves. They noticed that uh, they felt like the Greek-speaking widows were sort of being left out or uh, not being taken care of as well as the, the others. And uh, so they came to the apostles and they said, look, we, here's a problem. And the apostles, I love the way they handled it. They said, look, we've we got to keep doing what we're meant to do. We've got to preach the word of God and, and so on. Um, why don't you guys find some people filled with wisdom and the Holy Spirit and work it out and uh, make it happen. And so they did. It's, it, it's a great, uh, great model of people seeing in need and uh, putting their hand to the plow and not just... How many of you know it's not a spiritual gift to find a problem? Anyone know that? I've been through 1 Corinthians. I can't find uh, finding a problem as a spiritual gift in there. Anyone can find a problem, but it takes a bit of wisdom to fix a problem. And that's what we see in this uh, collection of ancient documents about the early church. Lots of issues and problems, but they put their hand to the plough and they became an answer to those problems. So we're going to have a little bit of a look today at uh, something that Stephen said. We've been talking for the last few weeks about three things that we're told not to do uh, to the person of the Holy Spirit, who is God's representative down here on earth, dwelling inside of us. Jesus said, I won't leave you as orphans. When I go, uh, he said, I have to go, because if I don't go, the Spirit won't come. And he said, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. My Spirit's going to dwell inside everyone that bows their knee to Jesus Christ, becomes a follower of Jesus. I'll give you my Spirit, and my Spirit will empower you to walk in my ways. My Spirit's going to teach you. It's going to guide you. So we, in a very real sense, have a relationship down here right now with the Godhead person of the Holy Spirit. That lives within us. And so by the Holy Spirit, Stephen gets up and he begins to preach this amazing message. And, and we're talking about three things we shouldn't be doing. We talked about grieving the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians talks about don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And we had a look at the whole context of that and how it related to the body and discerning the body of Christ. We then moved on to quenching the Spirit, First Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, we looked at what quenching the Holy Spirit means in our own personal lives and so on. Then last week we kind of digressed a little and we talked about fanning that Spirit. So if we can quench the Spirit in our life, we can also fan the Spirit. Fan to flame, the NIV Bible says, that spirit in our life as well. So we looked at that last week. This week I want to dive into the last one and we're going to have a bit of a look at uh, resisting the Holy Spirit, what it means to resist the Spirit. So in Acts chapter 7 we've got this amazing uh, speech, this amazing message that it's actually the longest recorded message uh, of anybody in this collection of ancient documents. So this message here that Stephen preaches, it's the longest recorded one. There's no message that Paul preached. Mind you, there was a message Paul preached one night. Do you remember that one where a guy fell out of a window? Do you remember that? He was sitting in the window. Yep, yep. So if I go for 30 minutes, do not winch, please. You could have been sitting. You could have Paul the Apostle up here. He could be preaching for days. Um, but Paul's cool. He just goes down there, heals the guy, goes back up and keeps on, keeps on preaching. I'm not... I don't have the faith to do that, so we'll keep it short. Um, so in, in Acts chapter 7, we've got this story of his message, and it's pretty well outlined. And if you have a look at it, there's a bunch of religious leaders there, and Stephen goes through pretty much a history of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And there are key trigger points, so I won't read the whole thing because it's a very long message, but there are trigger points along the way there where when I read that, I can almost imagine like a really... Ex external uh, uh, hyper Pentecostal church, you know, where he's going and, and the God of our fathers called us and blah, blah, blah. And I can see them sitting there going, preach it, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I can see them really getting into this message that he's preaching to them. But in verse 51, he takes a really, really sharp detour. And I can imagine that all the amens and the high fives and the preacher brothers came to an abrupt halt in verse 51. And here's where he goes from verse 51 to 57. He does suddenly turns and he says, you stiff-necked 
and uncircumcised in heart. How many of you would love it? Who would come back next week if I stood up here and said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart? I don't think you would want to probably hang around too much. You'd probably think I was being judgmental or being critical or whatever. Either way, here's what I know. You wouldn't want to hear me say that. You don't feel that you need to hear that from me, and you wouldn't be very happy if I said it. But Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't care. He got up in their faces after buttering them up, so to speak, and then he goes, now, here's here's where I want to go with this whole thing. Everything you've been amening, because you've been amening all this, because you're hearing what you want to hear. Now I'm going to show you what you need to hear. Amen? How many of us are like that? We want to hear what we want to hear. But God's committed to not just telling me what I want to hear. God has a commitment to make sure that he communicates to me what I need to hear. And often what I need to hear is not what I want to hear. I'm programmed to think that I need to hear what I want to hear. But the truth is, God says, no, no, you need to hear what you need to hear. I want you to hear what it is that you need to hear. And so he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Always resist. That sounds like a blanket statement, doesn't it? Anyone hate blanket statements? I hate it when I'm, me and Jackie might be having a disagreement and, and, and she'll say to me, you always, and I go, I don't always. always. So every time do I always? I never say that to her. Um, <laughs> she always, I never. Both blanket statements, aren't they? Um, so anyway, he says, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, those that told them that Jesus was coming, of whom you have now become the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels, but you didn't keep it. When they heard these things, look at their reaction. They were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. Have you ever been that frustrated with your children that you've gnashed your teeth? Or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. I'm, it's okay, I'm a pig below probably, but I've been frustrated enough at times I've gnashed my teeth. Oh, I'm so frustrated. These guys are gnashing their teeth at him. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I love that picture there. Every time I hear of a, of a martyr, every time I hear of somebody, in, like in nations like India and so on right now, they're still being uh, murdered for their faith. They're still being martyred for no other reason than they associate themselves with Jesus Christ. There are many nations on earth. We are so blessed, amen? We are so incredibly blessed here in this country at the moment. But there are a lot of nations not like ours. And I love this image, this picture that I, I believe, and I'm not making a doctrine out of it, I'm just saying, I believe that when people get to that point and God knows you are not, you're serious about this, you are not going to back down, you'll give your life. I, I, I read that and I think, God, how beautiful. It looks like, almost like you put a grace upon them. And maybe they don't even feel it in that last moment. They get a vision of heaven and they see the face of Jesus and they know, they know, they know, they know they're doing the right thing. They know they're standing for the one true God. And and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped up their ears and they ran at him with one accord. And Stephen was stoned in that very moment. See, Stephen's telling them to start with. He's telling them what they want to hear. And then he switches channels and he starts to tell them what they need to hear. Here's what's happened. Even, even when you go back and you read it, throughout that, 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 that whole discourse of Acts 7, several times he tells them, and God, and we disobeyed God. And God said this, but we went here and we went this. But they didn't even hear it. They weren't even hearing it. And then right at the end, it's almost like he goes, you're not going to get it unless I just, I've got to take a really sharp turn here. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. What? You know? He gets their attention. Because God is committed to us hearing what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. There are lots of things I want to hear. But there are also things I need to hear. Amen? There are lots of things you want to hear, but there are things that you need to hear. If you're serious about your relationship with God, if you're serious about being the best ambassador for Christ you can with this tiny window of time you have down here on planet Earth, then there are some things you need to hear. If you're going to do what it is that God wants you to do with the life that he's given you, then there are probably things you want to hear, but there are things you need to hear. Because if you don't want to hear the things that you need to hear, you won't end up doing the things he wants you to do. If you're not prepared to hear the things you need to hear, you will not become the person he wants you to become. If you don't want to hear what you need to hear, you'll never uh, uh, come to the cross and surrender those areas of your life. You'll never seek healing for the hurts. You'll never look for, for answers to the issues. You, you, you won't walk in humility. You, you, you won't. If, if you, your whole life consists of, I just want to hear from God what I want to hear, then every time God starts to speak to you about what you need to hear, you know what you'll do? You'll probably up and run. 
You'll up and run. You'll do what these guys did. It says they covered their ears and they gnashed their teeth. See, we'll do anything, won't we, to not hear what we need to hear at times because we're so programmed in our culture, we should be hearing what we need to hear. You know, it should make me feel good. Amen? Everything should make me feel good. And if it doesn't make me feel good, it can't really be God, you know? I think somewhere along the line, we've lost the fact that, that God is multifaceted, but God is God. And, and God is not a slot machine that we put a coin in and we just get out of that whatever we want, you know? Uh, God's job is not to make me happy. God's job is not to, 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 to bow to my every whim and so on. He is God. And somewhere along the lines, if we're not careful, we talk about the love of God, which I believe in wholeheartedly, but we can easily reverse the image whereby God becomes subservient to us. Amen? But God is never going to be subservient to me. God is God and I learn to trust him. I've got to learn to listen to him and walk with him. And I've got to learn to be prepared to hear what it is that I need to hear from him. That's what Stephen's trying to say in this speech here, in this message that he's given to them. And that's the question for us. So we open to hearing what we need to hear from God. Are you actually open to hearing what you need to hear from God? Now, what does it mean by resist? He says you always resist the Holy Spirit. I'll give you two, two Greek words that are there for resist. One of them is the Greek word antihistamine. Anyone know where we might, what word we might get from that? Antihistamine? Yeah? Anyone? Huh? Antihistamine, exactly. It's, it's where we, we get our word antihistamine from. And the word antihistamine is, is used twice in the New Testament, in 1 Peter uh, and in James, both times referring to resist the devil and he'll flee, right? Whenever it's talking about resisting the devil, the Greek word used is antihistamine. And it means, it, it, it means to set oneself against or to withstand, right? The picture of it is this, is putting your feet down like that and not backing down. I'm not going to back away. How many of you know that the, the devil is coming after people these days? I, I, I believe in the devil. I believe he's here. I'm not scared of him. Uh, the de- it's, there's, there's not a battle going on where the devil and God are equal. Some people have that image in their head that the devil and God are on equal footing and they're battling. It's not even a fight. Like God is God. The devil is the devil. It's, it's not like that. But the devil comes after God's children. He comes after God's plans. He does what he can. Uh, I believe the devil has two plans for everybody's life. Number one, it's to keep you from coming to faith in Jesus. He wants to keep you from coming to a saving faith in Christ because he knows that God has good things for you, knows that God loves you. Uh, uh, And so he goes after God's kids. He can't touch God, so he goes after God's children. And what he wants to do is plan A, keep you from coming to faith in God. And, And the second plan is if he can't stop you coming to faith in God, his second plan is he'll make you apathetic about your faith. Okay, I'm in. I've got my fire insurance ticket here. I'm going to heaven when I die. But now I'm just going to cruise through life. I'm not really that concerned about extending the kingdom. Really not that concerned about being an ambassador for Christ. Really not that concerned about what the difference prayer can make in the world. Really not that concerned about worship. Really not that concerned about getting the word of God in me so that it can read my heart. Really not that concerned about becoming a disciple. Really not that concerned. I've got my fire insurance and I'm going. And so I'll do enough. Anyone work with people or play sport with people, they do just enough to stay in. Yeah? They do just, I've played sport for years at representative level and, it's, and, and there are guys that do just enough to stay in the team. And you look at them and go, man, you could do so much more. There's so much more that you could contribute. You could be so much better at that, but we do just enough. It's like kids go to school and I'll do just enough to get a pass. I'll do just enough to get a pass. That way I keep getting passes, I can stay there. But dude, you could be getting A pluses. You're a very intelligent human being if you applied yourself. You know, but I do just enough. And that's what the devil wants for us. If he can't keep us out of the kingdom, then he'll make us apathetic about things to do with the kingdom. But what this word here, resist, means, it means to plant your feet and to stand your ground against that. Don't let the devil push you backwards. Don't let him take ground back from you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 13. Paul says this. He says, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to what? Stand. Stand against the devil. Some people in the morning, they pray and they put on the armor. Some people get up and they, I don't care how you put on the armor of God. It doesn't bother me. Just do what he says and get it on. All right? Just get it on you. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because the devil's coming after you. There are wiles that are coming after you from the enemy. So stand against that stuff. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle, don't we? There's a battle going on. He says, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. You're not my enemy. You're not my enemy. There's other stuff going on. Anyone ever read those books, Piercing the Darkness? Remember those books years ago? Piercing the Darkness, 
this present darkness. Now I'm not saying they're theology textbooks, but what I'm saying is the imagery that Frank Peretti creates in that, that there's something going on here in the natural that doesn't seem to make sense. And then he sort of pulls back the curtain and he shows you the angels and the demons and what's going on behind the scenes that's kind of motivating and feeding into uh, what you see in the natural and the practical. If you want to get a bit of an idea of what Paul's probably getting at here, get a hold of those books. They're old books, but they're brilliant, brilliant books, Piercing the Darkness, This Present Darkness. He says, For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rules of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And then he says this, Therefore, because we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but because we are wrestling, there is a spiritual battle going on. Because of that, therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And when you've done everything, stand. That's what this word means when it talks about resist, when he says in Peter and James, resist the devil. It means stand. Stand your ground. The other word that's used when Stephen preaches here and he says, uh, you always resist the Holy Spirit, it's the word antipipto, not antipasto, antipipto. This is the only time in the Greek New Testament that this word is used. It's not used anywhere else. And the picture of this one is literally of walking in the opposite direction. I want you to think about that. Walking in the opposite direction. So you're not just standing your ground. Enemies coming at you and you're standing your ground, you're not giving him any ground. I want you to imagine that, that something's coming towards you, but you are literally walking in the opposite direction, pushing against that very thing. Anyone go to the gym in this place? Anyone ever go to a gymnasium? Yep, as you can tell, I don't. Um, you go to a gym and they have these hydraulic machines. And what you do with the hydraulics is you push against it. But the idea is with hydraulic is you push against it, but that hydraulic is also pushing against you, isn't it? If you, if you, if you, you, you uh, are pushing against it, but it's, it's got a certain poundage or whatever that's pushing back at you, and if you let it go, it's going to push back at you. So in order to move the thing, you've got to push against it, but it's pushing back against you. That's a great image of what, what he's talking about here when he says resisting the Spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit is going here, and you are deliberately pushing back in the opposite direction to that which the Holy Spirit is pushing, to that which the Holy Spirit is going. It means walking in the opposite direction. You're not just standing there passively. You're literally walking against the Holy Spirit. This is what Stephen's saying. You're not just passively standing there. You are literally walking against what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and has said to you as a people. So what does it mean to resist the Holy Spirit? Here's what it means when you put all that together and you go back and you look at what he's saying. It means to walk in opposition to the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God that has been revealed to you. Walking in opposition to the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God that's been revealed to you. Stephen said in his, his speech in Acts, he says to them that, that, that uh, who our fathers would not obey but rejected and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. Acts 7.39, speaking about the children of Israel earlier on the speech, he says that, 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 that we wouldn't obey him. But here we were sort of being led. We came out of Egypt and we're going in a direction. But he says, but then there was a point in our hearts, even though we're walking, but in our hearts, he says, we turned back. They never physically went back to Egypt, but he says in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. In other words, God's wanting to take them this way, but we just decided we're going to turn back that way. We still look the part because we're still in the crowd and we're still walking, we're still going, but in our hearts we have turned back towards Egypt. I mean, I still come to church, I still come to pray, or I still turn up on a Sunday, I still, but, but in my heart I'm actually heading back that way. I still do all the stuff, I read my Bible, I pray, but in my heart I'm slowly heading back that way. I'm pushing in a different direction. That's the image, the picture that he's saying. He points out that Israel had a history of resisting the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God. What did he say? He says, you resist the Holy Spirit. And then he explains how. He says, you persecute the prophets. Who are the prophets? Those who came and spoke the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God to them. He says, you, you persecute them. And then he goes on, he says, and you kill those who foretold the coming of Jesus. Again, those who spoke the word of God to you. You killed them. You killed them. The Holy Spirit inspired word of God comes to you and you run in the opposite direction. That's what resisting the Holy Spirit is. Jesus also accused the religious leaders of the same thing in Matthew chapter 23, 29 to 30. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and you say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. He says, But you're going to kill me. 
and they've spoken about me for centuries. Your forefathers told you I was coming, but you still want to run in a different direction to what God is saying to you. So very quickly, how do we resist the Holy Spirit in the year 2023? To my knowledge, none of us are ancient Israelis. I'm looking around now, you all look like you're 20... First century dressed up, modern type, good looking people. Not that I'm saying they weren't, I wasn't there, don't know. Uh, and you probably not physically killed any prophets, to my knowledge, as well. Amen. Anyone ever killed a prophet? No? Good, good. Yeah, maybe in your heart, but not physically. This is talking physically here. So, how do we resist the Holy Spirit in the year 2023? Well, we resist the Holy Spirit in these three ways. Number one, we resist the Holy Spirit when we fail to accept the good news about Jesus. When we fail to accept the good news about Jesus, you are resisting the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, It's the will of God that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. You know, the Holy Spirit was at work in your life before you ever walked in the doors of a church, before you ever picked up a Bible, before you ever prayed a prayer, before you ever gave your life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit was at work. I know that because apart from the Holy Spirit, your flesh did not draw you to Christ. The devil did not draw you to Christ. It was the Holy Spirit at work before you ever came to faith. And the Holy Spirit is out there and he's, he's calling people and he's, he's, he's urging people to, to come to faith in Christ. Come to faith in Christ. Come to faith in Christ. Look at Jesus. The Holy Spirit is doing his job. He's convicting the world of, of righteousness and judgment and, and, and he's out there and he's doing amazing stuff. That's, that's what we talked about at the start. When we walk out these doors, are you aware that the Spirit of God is doing things? Do you want to open yourself up to be a partner with the Holy Spirit? I I do. I want to be out there making a difference for the Lord because my time is going to go like a vapour smoke and I'm going to be gone. And guess what? Most people down here on planet Earth, 10 years after my death, are not going to remember me. There probably won't be statues and monuments. My, my family probably will. But give it 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I will be nothing but somebody that once lived here that nobody knows about. They're not going to build a stadium in my honour. Um, there's, there's not going to be anything like that. But what I will have is, is, is hopefully I can, I can plant seeds and hopefully God will use me while I'm down here that when I get up there, I'll bump into faces and I'll be able to go, I'm so glad that I bumped into you. I'm so glad I stopped and chatted to you. I'm glad I prayed for you that day. Thank you, God, for letting me be a part of the journey of these different people. But when we resist the Holy Spirit, we fail to accept the good news about Jesus. And don't assume that everybody that believes in Jesus bows their knee to Jesus. How many of you know people? They know God is real, but they refuse to bow their knee. The Holy Spirit is pulling them this way, come to me. And they are digging their heels in and walking the other way and going, no. I had a conversation with a young man about six months ago. And uh, uh, he was wrestling back and forth with the reality of God. Is he there? Is he not? Is he there? Is he not? And so one night at about 11 o'clock, he prayed. He said he, he was, he was uh, out in the streets walking around somewhere and he prayed. He said, Lord, God, if you're really there, then, then, you, gotta, then, then, then you show me that you're there. Five minutes later, he gets a phone call on his phone from a guy in Brisbane who happens to be a Christian, who says to him, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I just felt like God spoke to me and said I should ring you up. What's going on in your world? He gets so freaked out by this that it's 11.30 at night, he rings me up at home and says, can I come and chat to you? I said, yeah, no worries. So he comes over to my house and we're chatting. And he's telling this story to me. I prayed this and this happened. And he says to me, what do you think? <laughs> I said, dude, it doesn't matter what I think. You want to know what I think? That's God. That is God. You prayed a prayer, and now you've got a choice. You prayed that prayer five minutes later, somebody in Brisbane rings you up. Answer me this. Was it chance, luck, or coincidence? Or is it God? They're your options. Which one is it? I said, I believe that that was God. And he said to me, you know what? I believe it was God too. I said, great. If you believe that was God, now the next question is, what are you going to do with that answer to prayer? What are you going to do with a God that so listened so intently to your prayer when you weren't interested in him and pursued you so much that he woke a dude up in Brisbane at 11 o'clock at night, whatever, and told him to ring you up? What are you going to do with that God? You know, six months on, unfortunately, that young man still not walking with the Lord. So it doesn't matter. God can call you. You can, you can believe in God, but you still got to make that decision to not resist the Holy Spirit. And if you're here today and you know deep down inside that God is real, let me tell you something. If you don't come to faith, you're probably going to be in for a world of hurt because he loves you and he's not going to leave you alone. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to track you down. And there's nothing more frustrating and depressing in life than to know that God is calling you, but putting your dukes up and fighting against him. And, and you know what? Because you know what happens? You, you can't enjoy life out there because you know deep down inside there's something more. And so you can't fully dive into here because there's something in you, the Holy Spirit, that's drawing you over here. You want to dive in here and just live like the world, but you know there's something different over here. Well, I want to say to you, that's the Holy Spirit. 
And as long as you are not giving in to that, as long as you are not responding to that, according to what Stephen says, you're that person, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. You're resisting the Holy Spirit because you're standing against uh, the, the revealed knowledge that God is real, Jesus died for you, and so on. So you've got to make that decision. I hope and pray that you make that decision very, very quickly. The second way that we resist the Holy Spirit is we resist the Holy Spirit when we fail to walk in the known will of God. What is Stephen talking about? He says, you, it's the prophets and those are foretold. It's, it's these people that came and they spoke the word of God and you resisted it by going in the opposite direction. In 2023, we can go against the revealed, the, the known will of God. How many of you know that, that this was not just something that, uh, you know, a bunch of guys decided one day after a couple of ham sandwiches to just write out some thoughts about God? And lo and behold, what a coincidence, 66 of them match up and they're all talking about the same dude. What a coincidence, over 1,600 years on three different continents. What a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. The, the, the word of God, these writers were inspired. It says it was in, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit and they wrote this stuff down. There is incredible wisdom. How many of you know there is incredible wisdom in the pages of these ancient documents? You want, you, got, you want to know how to manage finance. There's stuff in here about money. There's stuff in here about relationships. There's stuff in here about brokenness and hurt. There's stuff in here about healing. There's stuff in here about, about, about how you treat your enemies. There's stuff in here about conflict resolution. There's stuff in the pages of these books about just about every aspect and area of life that you could imagine and come across and experience. And yet it's amazing. Uh, the reading of the Word of God, statistically, when they do research and studies every year, it's getting less and less and less and less and less. Yet right there at our fingertips... We have something that was inspired by the Holy Spirit written down thousands of years ago so that in 2023 we could have access to this whole collection of things that tell us the known will of God. There are, some things, there are answers to questions in there that you probably have right now. There are decisions you've got to make and you're wrestling, wondering, yet if you'd open the pages of these ancient documents, you might find God already has some answers for you. He's already told you that you should forgive your enemies. He's already told you that you should be generous. He's already told you a whole bunch of things in there. But we don't want to spend time in there. Now, unfortunately, it does take a little bit of time. But let me tell you something. You're going to invest your time into something in this life, aren't you? You're going to invest it into Netflix. But you're going to come out of it not with much in your spirit, are you? Or you can invest a little bit of time in the Word of God and prayer and these disciplines, and you're going to come out with a little bit more in your life. So the second way we resist the Holy Spirit is we fail to walk in the known will of God. Luke 6.46, Jesus said this in the parable of the wise and foolish builder. He begins that whole parable by saying this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? What he's really saying is, you can't really call me your Lord if you're not going to do what I'm saying. It's okay, we're, you know, you, you like me and we're friends, but I'm not really your Lord if you don't do what I say. And then he goes on, he tells the story of the wise and foolish builder. Both of them, both suffer the same storm. They both come under the same pressures. One built their house on sand, one on rock. They both uh, built a house. There. Everything's in common in that parable, in that story, by one thing. It says the one that built on the rock heard the words of Jesus and did it. The other one heard the words of Jesus but went off and did his own thing anyway. And the one that heard the words of Jesus and did it, he's the one that calls him Lord and he's the one whose house didn't fall at the end. James 1.22 encourages us. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It's not about hearing. It's not just about knowing. It's not about uh, building a resume of scripture verses that I've memorized in my life. It's about am I doing the known will of God, what God has given me, what he said here. Am I to the best of my ability by the power of the Holy Spirit, am I walking in that, am I living in that, or am I not? You'd be amazed at the wisdom for life lived that's already been given to us in the pages of these ancient documents. So number one, we resist the Holy Spirit when we fail to accept the good news about Jesus. Secondly, we resist the Holy Spirit when we fail to walk in the known will of God. Number three, we resist the Holy Spirit when we fail to respond to the revealed will of God. How many of you know that when, I was, was going, when this uh, beautiful woman noticed how unbelievably attractive I was and pursued me with all her heart and chased me down and tracked me down and then wanted to marry me because I asked her to... <laughs> How many of you know, I, I went through the pages here and I, I, there's some, I couldn't find Thou Shalt Marry Jackie. I can't even find your, I cannot even find your name in here. Your, your name's not even in here. I'm surprised I married you. Um, I should have gone after a Sarah or a Mary or something, you know. Um, but there's some things in life, isn't there, where, okay, we don't get the exact, should I take this job, should I not? Should I move to this town, you know, should I not? 
There's some things that we don't have answers to in the pages of these ancient documents, but we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And Jesus said that he will take of what is mine and he'll reveal it to you. They said, Jesus said he will guide you into all truth. Amen? So sometimes the Holy Spirit inside of us will speak to us as well. Uh, some people call it a prompting or an unction, or I don't care what you call it, but you know deep down inside that the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, he's leading you, he's guiding you, he's asking you to do something, he's maybe answering a question. Now here's the, the, the caveat to that, is that he's never going to take you outside the boundaries of the known will of God. The Holy Spirit's not going to prompt me to, I don't believe, the Holy Spirit's not going to prompt me to leave my wife. He's not going to prompt me to do that. Uh, the Holy Spirit's not going to prompt me to uh, cheat on my taxes. He's not going to prompt me to rob a bank. He's not going to prompt me to do any of that stuff because that would be outside of what I know as the revealed will of God. But there are things that the Holy Spirit speaks to me in my everyday life, guidance and things that I need. I, don't have a re- I didn't come to faith and have a relationship with a book, I have a relationship with God. Amen? And I am led. Paul says those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Those who are led by the Spirit. And that's really what we've been talking about for the last two months, is being a people who are led by the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know we are living in a a time, a season, a period in human history where we really need to listen to the voice of the Spirit? We really need to learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit in our day and age. I'm not saying they haven't had to in the past, but I'll tell you now, it's getting harder and harder now, and we really do need to be attuned to the voice of the Spirit in the times in which we live. And so the third way that we resist the Holy Spirit is we fail to respond to the revealed will of God. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you on the inside? And have you walked in everything he said to you? It's funny, because this week, while I was putting this, studying this out, the Holy Spirit reminded me, he said, Alan, and here's a funny thing. He said, Alan, do you remember about 30 years ago I spoke to you to give $50 to this man's ministry? South African guy in Brisbane. <laughs> And, you know, over the years, every now and then, the Holy Spirit would bring that up. And my attitude would be, oh, yeah, no, I'll do that. I'll get to that. 30 years. 30 years of not doing it. And this week, the Holy Spirit said, Alan. <laughs> and so I went, okay. And, I, and, and so now I'm, 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 I've started the process of getting 50 bucks. I'm trying to calculate the interest over 30 years. That's a lot, isn't it? I should have just paid it back then. It's going to cost me way more now. But again, it was something the Holy Spirit laid on my heart. He asked me to do something, and I just kind of pushed it off to the side, and I didn't respond to it. And in that sense, the Spirit's saying, go this way. So what did I do? I went this way. I resisted the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think resisting the Holy Spirit is this. It it doesn't necessarily mean there's malice in your heart, but these are ways that we resist the Holy Spirit. A few years ago, I remember a guy on, on another side of that. He had a... He was a guitarist. He used to lead worship and love playing guitar. And uh, he went and bought this really expensive guitar one day, like really expensive. Nick, you would have been impressed. I don't know all that stuff, but I just know he loved his music, his guitar, bought an expensive guitar. When he brought that guitar and he brought it into a room and I saw the guitar, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, go and ask him to pray about giving it to you. I couldn't even play guitar. (laughs) And I'm like, what? But the Holy Spirit said to me, go and ask him to pray about giving you that guitar. So anyway, I didn't. I put it off, put it off. After about three months, I realised, you know what, I've just got to get this off my chest. So I bumped into him and I said, look, I know this is going to sound really weird and probably wrong and you're a very mature believer and at that stage I was not, you know, it would have been more than 20 years ago. I was early in my faith. And I said, and this is weird and strange. Look, it's freaking me out too, dude. I don't even know if this makes sense. But I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to ask you to pray about giving me that brand new spanking gazillion dollar guitar that you bought for yourself. And he looked at me and went, oh, dummy, you know what? Three months ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, after I bought it and I walked in, you've got to give this to Alan. Sorry, I forgot. And he gave me the guitar. <laughs> so anyway, I learned how to play guitar, led, led worship over in India when we lived there, and I passed it on to an Indian pastor when we, when we left the place. But we resist the Holy Spirit when we fail to respond to the revealed will of God. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? So three ways. According to what Stephen said, Stephen's accusation against them was the revealed word of God has come to you. The Holy Spirit inspired word of God. Every time it comes to you, Israel, you reject it. You reject it. You reject it. And how do we reject it? We reject it when we fail to accept the good news, when we fail to walk in the known will of God, and when we fail to respond to the revealed will of God. We also do. At the end of that, the crowd says they covered their ears and they gnashed their teeth. Ever covered your ears in order to try and escape the truth? Ever covered your ears? Shut up your ears because you don't want to hear the truth about Jesus and his reality? Or you don't want to hear the truth about yourself and where you're really at? Or you don't want to hear the truth about your life? 
Or you don't want to hear the truth about your situation or the circumstance that you're facing? That's not what I want to hear, God. We don't want to do it his way quite often because deep down inside, we actually don't really believe that life with God is an upgrade. We see it as a bit of a downgrade. Times we don't realise that God actually has the best for us. One thing I know about God in my time walking with him, I've never... And when we've lived in India and we've, 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 we've lived in some situations and circumstances. I've never been ripped off by God. Never. Never. I fought against him. I haven't wanted to do what he said. I haven't wanted to let go of the things he said to let go of. I haven't wanted to pick up the things he said pick up. I've wanted to buck against him. But one thing I know, I've never, ever, ever been ripped off by my Heavenly Father. Life with God, he takes from me because he always has something better. And that's hard for my natural brain to wrestle with because my natural brain has trained me to recognise what's better and what's worse. But in God's economy, he flips the switch sometimes. He says to me, Alan, I want you to pack up everything. I want you to sell everything. I want you to go and live in central India and go and work with poor people over there. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a second. I'm a pretty talented dude. I could be the next rock star singer of a rock band. I could play rugby league for the West Tigers. And God, you know they need rugby league players right now. You know? I could do anything. I could do a lot of things in my life. But God says, go over there. And I, all of a sudden, you can't watch for me. But, but, but you give it up and you go over there and you do that. And something happens on the inside of you and you realize, you know what, God? This is way better than what I had over there. Wow. Oh, but I couldn't see it, God, until I stepped out in faith and I trusted you. And I stopped resisting the Holy Spirit. And I went to the places that you want to me to go. And I did the things that you wanted me to do. It's not too late to stop resisting the Holy Spirit in your life if you are. I want to just finish with these words from the prophet Jeremiah. Spoken to Israel when Israel was in exile. They were in captivity in Babylon for a long, long time. They weren't on the top of a mountain, so to speak. They were in the bottom of a valley. And in the midst of that, the word of God came to them. And here's what God said to them in Jeremiah 29, 11. You all know it. He says, I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you not to harm you. I I know you think if you let that go, if you stop resisting me and you go with me, I know you think that that's going to hurt you, harm you. I'm telling you right now up front, nothing. There's no plan I have for you that's designed to hurt you. It's going to prosper you. You're going to be better off. Your walk with me is going to be stronger. Your faith in me is going to grow. You're going to learn some things through this. You're going to be challenged and you're going to respond and you're going to come out and you're going to look back down the track and go, wow, I am so much more stronger in my faith, Lord. God, you've used me in ways I couldn't have imagined. Why? Because I stopped resisting the Holy Spirit. I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. So I just want to encourage you this morning, if you're here and you know in your heart you have been resisting the Holy Spirit, maybe you don't know Jesus and you're waiting for something else to happen, but you know deep down, don't keep waiting for something. Respond to Jesus. You don't have to know everything. All you need to do is open your heart up. All you need to do is, 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 is Lord, I repent. God, I, I change my ways. Repentance is not just something we say. I'm going to turn around. God, I've been walking that way, and I know you're not pleased with it. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to start walking with you. God, I thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. Lord, come into my life. Make me the person you want me to be. Take me to the places you want to take me to. Submit yourself to him. Maybe you've been resisting the Holy Spirit because you, you're just not doing what you already know in the, in the revealed will of God. The word of God, you know what the word of God says, but you just don't want to do it. You still don't want to do it because, you know, life's better over here. I'm telling you it's not. God's into upgrades, not downgrades. It's not too late. Or maybe it's those spoken unctions, those things that you know the Spirit's been saying to you, but you're resisting that and you're still not moving in that. I want to encourage you today. Do a little bit of business with God over the coming week. Sit with God. Sit with the Holy Spirit. Listen to him. Stop fighting against. Stop fighting against him. That's what, that's what Stephen said. Resisting the Holy Spirit is knowing what God is saying, but going in the opposite direction direction and I don't know about you I don't want to be that person that knows what my heavenly father is saying to me knows what the holy spirit is saying to me knows what God's requiring of me but spend my whole life fighting against it I've done it at times and guess what it is so so tiring and in in the end I always lose out amen so father I want to thank you for your word God we want to thank you for uh, this morning Lord God thank you for uh, uh, God your presence with us Lord, I pray for each person in this room. God, I include myself in this. Lord, if we are resisting the Holy Spirit in our own ways, Father, if we are resisting 
uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, if we're digging our heels in and, and we think that the world is way better and we just don't want to respond, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you just make that so evident and clear to people in this room? Lord, if we are resisting the known will of God, would you make that evident and clear to us in this room? If we are resisting the unknown will of God, that unction, that leading of the Holy Spirit, would you make that well known to anybody in this room? And Father, I thank you, Lord, as Jeremiah said, that you have plans for us to prosper us, not to harm us. God, you have plans to give us a hope and a future. And uh, Lord, as we step into this next week, again, as we do every week, Father, there are people in our community that do not know you, people in our community that are lost, that are struggling, that are looking for answers. And God, we know that deep down, the greatest need that any person has is to be reconnected to the Father through Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray, would you give each of us the opportunity this week to talk to somebody out there, somebody that doesn't yet know how much you love them, what you've done for them. Give us the words to speak, open the door of opportunity, and give us the courage and the boldness to walk into that space, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody this morning said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.